Keycloak, the open source uh, identity and access management uh, for modern application. Welcome to this talk here at KubeCon. Uh, we're very happy to be in our CNCF project. Uh, we, that's Keycloak. And today uh, I have Yuichi Nakamura here uh, from Hitachi. And I'm Alexander uh, from Red Hat. Um, I'm here, um, I'm working at Red Hat for a year now, but I looked it up, so I did my first pull request that was accepted on Keycloak, I think in 2015 or so. And then, like last year, joined Red Hat full-time, uh, working on the Keycloak project. So, yeah, Keycloak, what is that? Uh, it's an open source identity and access management solution, and the great thing about open source is that you can um, tweak it uh, the way you like it. Um, you can use it for authentication, authorizing users in your applications. You can configure it interactively or fully automated. So I'm a big fan of full automation. You can bridge it to existing security infrastructures. So um, in a normal, I would say, enterprise environment, you usually have um, maybe an existing LDAP, maybe an existing legacy user database, and you can connect those. Um, you can also extend and customize it as needed. As I said, it's open source, but we also offer lots of um, service provider interfaces, as we call them, where you can write your own modules, load them into Keycloak, and do the things that you need to do. And it runs and scales both in the cloud and non-cloud environments. And yeah, that's it. That's Keycloak, and a, I would say a very whole and good package to manage all your users and your whereabouts and clients. So what does Keycloak do? Um, well, it all starts with a user here. Um, they have their mobile devices, they have their laptops, they have their apps, and they want to access some services in the cloud. Um, so, and once they do that, um, without an access token at first, they will be redirected to Keycloak. Keycloak will present a logging screen, and once they enter their username and password or their other methods of authentication, they will then receive a token, and then they try again with token accessing that service. Um, and the service can use that token to uh, verify that it's really valid and uh, find out about uh, what the user is then, uh, maybe has some roles, what they can are allowed to do, uh, what's their username, what's their pa well, not the password, <laughs> about the username and uh, the email address, all that can be then retrieved using that token. And it's all about not um, handing the password or credentials to the application themselves. Okay. So, um, and in a, I would say in a, key, you can run Keycloak with its own database. So Keycloak makes sure that all the user passwords are hashed uh, uh, in a secure way and stored in a database. But in most cases, you have other stores um, in your company that you have an LDAP, you have an Active Directory, or as I said, a legacy user database uh, where you want to connect to, you want to pull data from it. Uh, you want to verify the passwords if they are stored in there. And Keycloak is there very flexible in this way, so because we have this uh, user federation built in, and as uh, again, as a service provider interface, we can extend it as needed. So let's do a, a demo of Keycloak and show some things around Keycloak. And well, you eventually see a login screen like this. Um, and the setup that we will well, walk through is that we have, um, I have everything set up on my laptop here on a Minikube, and we use the browser to uh, serve to Keycloak, uh, interact with this login screen. We will see a Grafana. Um, we will configure single sign-on for Grafana using Keycloak. Um, that's one of my favorite uh, projects here uh, at this conference. And well, Prometheus can uh, pull some metrics from Keycloak, um, so we know what's going on in there. And then Keycloak um, in this setup connects to a um, regular um, SQL database, in this case a Postgres database. And well, as we're a good, uh, I would say, Kubernetes citizen, Keycloak is of course deployed using a Keycloak operator. Great. And well, these are the moving parts <laughs> that we're about to see in this demo. Right. Um, yeah, let's do demo. So signing into Keycloak. Um, this is the login screen, and the login screen, you can well, enter a username and password. That's the, the simple case. Don't tell me, uh, don't tell you my secret password here. <laughs> and 
Well, you have everything you want to manage here. You want to manage, manage clients, you manage uh, client scopes, VM rows, everything is like in a nice admin UI here. And um, also these realm settings um, you've seen on this login screen, for example, uh, the user registration was enabled, the forgot password flow was enabled. And as I said, it's really a whole user management solution here. And uh, once I disable them and I log um, out again, um, you see that these things are gone here. I can no longer register. I can no longer have my uh, do the self-service once my password is forgotten. And if I then enable it again, it's just well nice to configure this on the very on the yeah on the, uh, on, the, on, the on the web UI. And the web UI, um, it's there's the, the REST backend for that web UI, and you can use the, the same functionality to um, have your fully scripted configuration of your realms. That's also possible. Um, there's a command line interface, uh, what we'll see in a second, that allows you to do all that scripting that you want to do here. And something I use very often in test environments, you can export a realm fully as a JSON, and then recreate as many test environments from the JSON as you want and reset it at any time um, you want uh, with that JSON file. Right, so, yeah, let's, um, yeah, as I said, I want to set up um, Grafana, and what you then usually do is setting up Grafana, oh, I did it already, so let's delete it here, we don't, and if you want to set up something, it would be tedious to do that in the command line, let's delete it. And, yeah, what I prepared, I prepared a script for this, um, let's, I uh, hope that the demo gods are with me. So that's the um, command line interface of Keycloak that I'm about to use. Um, for example, what I'm about to do, I find out the IP address of my Minikube running locally. I s give it some com uh, some environment variables where the trust is, so that TLS is um, no longer in my way. Um, I then uh, log into Keycloak on the command line, uh, giving it um, yeah, the, the URL as well, the user, I'm going to log into the realm. Then I can do everything I want to do here on the command line, for example, when I do that with Grafana in a second. Every user needs to have an email address, so I uh, equip the admin user with an email address. I then um, set up a client, um, and as I want to have this item potent, I want to delete it first and then recreate it. I can also edit it like I do with the user. And I have now a, a JSON file that sets up a client. Um, in this case, um, yeah, all these settings, I, that I did it once manually and then exported it from the UI and now I can re-import it in all my environments automatically or in a scripted way. And all this, um, let's make this URL dynamic, um, the root URL, the admin UI URL, um, all these flags, how the post logout should work, uh, all the things. The UI helped me to fill it out, I exported it and now can, uh, I can use it in my scripts. And uh, yeah, so, and finally, I also here mangle with the client scopes. So this client scope should have enabled some protocol mappers here so that the user info token claim is then enabled for the roles. Yeah. So you can really, really script everything that you want to have scripted here. And now let's do some typing here. Let's see, it's a bit tricky to do that here. Set up Grafana and Keycloak. So you saw me deleting that um, client um, in Keycloak, so I now run my script. And once that script is done, in a second, it's always taking longer when you're demoing, uh, that client is again here. So now my Grafana is fully set up uh, with all the URLs um, dynamically uh, replaced. Um, and now I'm ready to go do, uh, uh, do the configuration for Grafana. With Grafana. There's a Helm chart for Grafana, and in the Helm chart for Grafana, you can um, do all the configurations that are necessary, like you want to disable the, the default login screen, um, you want to do OAuth um, enabled, you want to set up a sign out URL, the client secrets, um, all the different URLs that Grafana should use to redirect the user, to, re um, to exchange uh, the code with a token, to retrieve some user details. All that's all, um, yeah, it's partly, well, OpenID Connect standards, and that's nice. On the other hand, it's also documented in the Grafana uh, documentation site, 
and well, this is now all set up. I ran my Helm already before, and what I'm doing now is I'm going to um, to Grafana, and I'm already logged in as I'm already logged into the admin console. That's the same login it's seeing a turn on, right? So let's show if I sign out here. So I'm signing out. Yes, I do want to log out. And now I'm logged out, and you will see that I'm also logged out uh, from the Keycloak admin UI, right? It's single sign in and single sign out. And now I log in to Grafana, and I'm logged in. Yeah, we should be authorized. And I go to the um, to my user details. If I go down here, I see that I'm also an admin because I did the filtering here, the role attribute path is then finding out the roles of the user and then making this user an admin. Right. So this is all set up. And the good news, is, well, I think OpenID Connect is a standard, that's nice. But uh, there's always a lot of to learn and fields and to fiddle around that and, uh, until to make it work. And the good news is about Keycloak that you can look into the logs, you can look into the source and understand how that all works. Um, yeah, that brings me to um, yeah, two dashboards and metrics. So let's see. Um, Keycloak provides metrics in a, I would say, Prometheus style way. So let's do Keycloak. Let's and just replace the URL here at the end with metrics. Who would have guessed that? And yeah, and then you have all the JVM metrics that you want to have. So about the memory we're using, um, the, uh, how our data source is doing in Java, um, how the connection pools are doing, um, how much time we're spending on garbage collection. Uh, if you're running a JVM, um, you will know that these are the things you're mostly interested in. Um, yeah, these are all there. You can add more metrics to this by enabling, for example, the metrics for InfiniSpan that we use internally, um, then you have ex those exposed here as well. And um, yeah, if you if you are an open telemetry open telemetry person, um, I've already uh, ran um, th the latest Keycloak version with Open Telemetry agent, and then you will expose um, metrics using Open Telemetry uh, tracing with Open Telemetry, and uh, well, I didn't do logs with Open Telemetry, but that should work as well. Um, right, so yeah, it behaves nicely and you have a nice observability of things going on inside your Keycloak instance. Especially when you're using the open telemetry, you will have metrics for each REST endpoint, so you can actually have the number of requests in each realm uh, as they're happening, uh, something you might be uh, very interested in. So how did I deploy this hour? Well, I can show dashboard, right? So everybody loves dashboards. This is now a custom dashboard that collects all this um, information we saw in the metrics endpoint. For example, how many of the garbage collections, how many are taking place, um, how much time I'm spending on garbage collection, how are my connection pools doing, um, right, and how, how are my threads doing in my key clock. That's all very useful information. And I also did a deployment here using Helm, but there's not so much Helm, it's mostly YAML anyway. Uh, so this is a custom resource um, f where I tell the operator of Keycloak how to deploy it. I give it a host name, uh, I point it to a database, give it a database pool, min and max size, um, like point it to a secret where the username and password live, and then I can have some more additional options here. For example, I want to use JSON output or log output, I want to have metrics enabled, so I want to have health enabled. I need to point it to a TLS secret, so that's something that changed recently when you, um, that you, we're actually forcing you to use a TLS secret um, when you're running in production. Um, then you can, how many instances do you want to have if you want us to set up an ingress for you. And this is actually a very, very nice feature. This, it's called unsupported, and yes, that's it. But um, it allows you to overwrite the pod template. Um, I, I, I struggle with operators quite a lot because I can't, make them do the things I want them to do. 
Um, and this is a, like an escape hatch, so you can override the things you want to override in the pod template. So this now allows me to, even if as the, there's no parameter in this uh, operator in this custom resource, to maybe specify other environment variables, I can still add them by adding this pod template. I can uh, tune the startup and readiness and liveness probes as I want them. I can also maybe add a port to do some JVM debugging. Well, of course, only in test systems, right? Never in production. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's the tour. So, yeah, we saw Keycloak has been deployed using operator. Um, we configured a client, and Grafana used single turn-on um, for that. So that's nice. So let's continue the slideshow. Um, yeah, and. I didn't touch so much on customization today, um, but there's the server developer's guide. So you can customize the theme, so colors and what whatnot uh, around the login and others. You can configure the login flows. For example, you can make the user confirm terms and conditions, register one-time password once they're logged in. Um, yeah, web awesome is supported. You can also add your own required actions um, to that flow by adding uh, uh, another SPI implementation, you can create event listeners. So when you want to know if either somebody did something in the admin UI, there are events. Um, if somebody logged in as a user, there are events. You can listen to those events and uh, make happen whatever you want to make happen in your environment. You, also, you can also supply methods for user federations uh, to support maybe custom attributes in LDAP and connect to any custom user storage as I said. If you want to engage with our community, um, there are, um, there's, uh, we all have everything on GitHub. Um, there are discussions on mailing lists and GitHub discussions. We have contributing guidelines for new contributors. Um, there's also a list of community contributions on this link here on the slide. And this is already um, handing over to the next talk here. The FAPI, this financial grade API security special interest group, that's one of our active user groups that um, yeah, you will explain that, right? <laughs> A little cliffhanger. Okay, so um, recent changes. I think I might be a bit low on time. So, well, we moved to Quarkus 2. Uh, we have a new operator, a new admin console. Uh, we support Web Awesome. Um, that's great. I'm looking forward, we're about to support or build upon uh, Quarkus 3. Uh, we'll have PIPs 140-2 support. And we're looking to get cross DC and multi-region support into Keycloak and support zero downtime upgrades. Um, there's also gonna be a new account console. As always, roadmap details are always subject to, subject to change. Right. Um, cool, so let's kick look. Um, so authenticate, authenticate your users, um, configure it interactively or fully automated, bridge to existing infrastructures, extend and customize as needed, and run in both cloud and non-cloud environments. And now I'm handing over to the second speaker of this talk. Yeah, here we are. Mm. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm Yuichi Nakamura from Hitachi. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, conformance, uh, Keycloak's conformance to API security profile. Uh, this is self in my self-introduction. I'm Yuichi Nakamura from Hitachi. Uh, I, I'm engaged with uh, open source uh, more than uh, 20 years. Uh, recently, I'm focusing on Keycloak. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not a maintainer, but I'm leading a uh, Keycloak uh, engineer team in Hitachi, and there is a maintainer. Uh, Takashi Norimatsu um, belongs to my team. Uh, I, I, I will introduce um, a feature about the API security profile on behalf of him. Uh, this is, uh, uh, as you know, um, background. As you know, uh, APIs are uh, everywhere now. Um, um, APIs, APIs are open, uh, opened by various sectors. And as, um, in cloud native, um, Microservices is a kind of an API. Um, to open API, security must be considered. Uh, 
uh, because uh, they are, op uh, they are uh, opened to the internet. Uh, the first step of security uh, authorization must be considered um, o um, to authorize the API. OS 2.0 is a de facto standard. Uh, uh, this figure shows a uh, um, very simplified uh, example of OS 2.0. A bank is uh, opening API to a uh, client, a uh, third party uh, fintech service. Uh, at first, the uh, client, client service access to uh, authorization server. If the uh, user and client is authenticated, uh, authorization server issues access token and the client uh, to uh, and cl client calls the API with access token. Uh, resource server uh, verifies access token, and if if it is verified, uh, resource server returns the resource uh, like balance information. Um, however, um, in improper uh, implementation of OS 2.0 uh, lead to uh, security holes. Uh, some attacks are known, uh, known such as uh, replay attack and the CSRF attacks. Uh, if uh, if the uh, security holes uh, of implementation is exploited, by exploited, uh, attackers can obtain the access token of a user and then call uh, API and, and can, attacker can obtain the uh, user's information. Uh, for high-level API security, um, a APIs are now opened by uh, critical uh, uh, industry uh, such as uh, finance and government. Um, uh, for such uh, usage, a specification called uh, FAPI security profile is getting attention globally. And uh, FAPI, uh, um, uh, yeah, this, uh, this figure shows a very overview of, uh, of the FAPI. Uh, OS 2.0 uh, is a framework, uh, but uh, there is a lot of freedom to implement, so improper implementation uh, leads to uh, security holes. Uh, on top of OS 2.0, OPID Connect is defined. However, it is not enough. Uh, improper implementation is, is uh, still not uh, restricted. Uh, on top of that, uh, FAPI is defined. Uh, FAPI defines a uh, uh, secure usage of OS 2.0 and OPID Connect uh, across the uh, protocol flow. Uh, this uh, figure shows the requirements specified by FAPI. There are a lot of requirements, uh, some extra uh, specification of OS, OS 2.0 uh, is, uh, uh, is recommended, uh, like uh, TXC and some uh, holder of key, uh, key token uh, specification is uh, required and the strong uh, algorithm uh, is required. Uh, this is a sequence to call API using FAPI. Uh, the sequence is basically the same as OS 2.0. Uh, however, uh, in every uh, request and response, um, uh, um, in, um, they are uh, authenticated uh, mutually, and <coughs> mutually, and the, uh, and the, uh, for the, uh, the request and the response is not tampered, is checked. Also, uh, in, in the uh, whole protocol, uh, in the whole flow, uh, each HTTP request and response uh, belongs to one uh, logical session is checked uh, by using extra parameters such as uh, state uh, and code state parameter and nonce parameter. And there are uh, various security profiles uh, related to FAPI, um, but they are not stable uh, or updated. Um, conformance tests and certification programs are provided by Open OpenID Foundation uh, to prove conformance. Um, we, we have to pass conformance tests uh, by OpenID Foundation. 
uh, there's an uh, example of security profile uh, FAPI, uh, in FAPI 1.0 family, uh, there are four types of uh, security profile. And in, in some region, uh, there are uh, some security profiles are defined uh, in UK open banking, and in, in Brazil, open banking Brazil is uh, specified. Uh, this is an uh, introduction of the FAPI SIG, uh, FAPI SIG in key clock, key clock community. Uh, it is very difficult to implement security profiles uh, because there are a lot of specifications to support security profiles and uh, they are often updated. And the configuring key clock for security profiles is not, is not, not easy. There, there are a lot to configure. Uh, to prove these problems, uh, some people uh, were interested in security profiles and they gathered in key group community uh, from various country and various, uh, uh, various um, com company. Um, they organized a uh, community called Papi Sig in uh, key group community. Uh, there is a repository and the, the, their uh, bi-weekly or monthly web conference is uh, called. Uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can view the uh, past presentation and the minutes uh, in this repository. Everyone, everyone can, can join. Uh, it's a very open community. Uh, this is achieve, achievements of FAPI SIG. Uh, major security profiles are supported and uh, developed and supported uh, by FAPI SIG members. Also, a uh, conformance test execution em environment is developed and automatically uh, executed. Um, uh, this uh, figure shows the result of the recent uh, uh, history of the con conformance test uh, result. The latest uh, key clock support uh, pa can pass um, major security prof uh, conformance test of major security profiles. It's a great achievement. Yeah. Uh, however, API security profiles are evolving. Uh, key clock also should also catch up the latest standards, uh, such as uh, standard for EKYC, uh, like OIDC for IDA, and FAPI 2.0 is now uh, defined, and OS 2.1 is defined. Uh, we have to catch up, and help is needed. Uh, if you are interested in uh, API security profiles uh, uh, for, to support uh, in Keycrock, uh, let's join a FAPI SIG meeting. A meeting schedule is announced in a Keycrock developers mailing list. Uh, you can join and view, uh, view the uh, archive from this uh, Google group. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that, that's all from me. And uh, I believe we have time for questions. So please. So there's going to be a microphone, or if you're sitting in the middle, I repeat your question then. Yeah, give it a start. Okay, uh, I've uh, listened to you speaking about Keycrook for the first time. Mm -hmm. It's been uh, an experience. Um, a good one. <laughs> Sorry. So the question was, um, could or how could we imp uh, improve the documentation as it's sometimes not uh, sufficient? Yeah, so um, you might see that the documentation is at the moment uh, doing a transition. There are kind of old book style documentation. And then there are some new, I would say, topic-based documentations. Um, 
it's sometimes a bit difficult to find the right one, as you might have experienced. So, but the the, goal, the future goal is to have more topic-based documentation, and um, that really focus on the different needs. And if you we uh, find something that's missing, uh, please open a GitHub issue. Um, if a documentation is missing, that's a bug. <laughs> and uh, we will handle it as a bug and uh, update the documentation as needed. Thank you. Uh, what about signing out uh, users from clients uh, when they get blocked or deleted? Is there anything like this planned or in the protocol somewhere? Um, so the user is blocked or the client is blocked? If I have an identity provider or a user base and I uh, block a user in there mm -hmm. or I delete the user, mm -hmm. if, uh, if there is an automated possibility to lock those users out of client applications. So, um, so, so the, you can um, kill the sessions of that user, that's possible. Um, depending on your setup, the access token might still be valid for some seconds or minutes, depending on your setup. So once you block the user and kill its uh, sessions, then it's, and depending on your setup, maybe plus a grace period of your access tokens being expiring, then they're locked out. So the session has to be uh, killed also? No, that's automatic, I believe. Or, well, it depends on, if you delete a user, the sessions are about to delete as well, um, I believe. I need to double check that. But you can, like, yeah, kill the sessions as well, um, either automatically or manually. Wouldn't I need to look it up in the docs? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, can I? Uh, uh, hi. Well, first of all, thank you for this presentation. Uh, but I was asking, what if I don't trust? Okay, I'll be a bit uh, provocative, but what if I don't trust Keycloak? I then don't want, for example. Uh, is it on? No, no, but I, I want people to, how to say, to proxy request to my backend, to hide using for authentication. Would it make sense or would it just hide a, a layer of complexity that wouldn't add anything to the, to this? Um. Well, if you want to hide Keycloak, you would hide or would miss out on a lot of functionality that is in Keycloak. So all this like login NFA, flow. Like. Yeah, NFA, login flows, uh, forgot password flow, um, registration flow. So all these flows that there are and that are configurable, you will miss out of that. Because in this moment, people will see that you're using Keycloak. Um, you c if you're then only up there for the tokens, then you could maybe hide have a facade that only accepts some tokens and exchange some tokens, but still people might look at the tokens and still see that you're using Keycloak. <laughs> <laughs> so, but maybe, do you want to answer that? Or, or, or maybe this person there in the back wants to, yeah. Okay. yeah Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, we use Keycloak in pu uh, production and um, we mainly use a legacy open LDAP um, uh, user store. Is there an easy way to migrate users to the internal Keycloak store instead? Well, you said LDAP and you're asking for easy. Okay. <laughs> um, probably not. Um, well, and <laughs> probably not. That will be my answer. Um, you could, well, you, if you find a Java developer or maybe a Java developer yourself, you could do like an incremental migration if you want to do that. So once they're logging in, you're importing that one user that's logging in. And I believe, I hope I'm not saying anything wrong here, that it should be possible to write a user provider that does that. Like user logs in, it's gonna be imported and then maybe scraped or deleted from your LDAP at the moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that, that's the route which we're looking at and yeah. And we'll then maybe <laughs> like do the last import at the end. Right, and by the way, we have some stickers. Uh, if the talk is really over, you can grab a sticker up here. We have yeah. another five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> I got this mic, so <laughs> just asking the question. You showed a Helm chart where you were deploying Keycloak from. So is this Helm chart publicly available somewhere? 
can we uh, contribute to it? It's because we're currently using our own one. Yeah, so um, the Helm chart you've seen is publicly available. Mm. Um, it was on the links, and all the links are in the slides, and the slides are on SCAD. But it's a Helm chart I wrote just for this demo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So there is no official uh, Keycloak helm chart currently? Um, the community has a helm chart provided. I think mm. maybe the people from Codecentric have one. Yeah, but this is not. OK, but then <laughs> collaborate on that. Uh, ah, and okay. uh, yeah. I think they're willing to take contributions on that. Thanks. Hi. Um, we're using Keycloak in development for now. We've been evaluating it and planning to use it in production. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> um, so our service is multi-tenant, so we're using a lot of uh, realms or for every customer. We'll be uh, using a specific, uh, uh, a dedicated realm, but we've also, um, we didn't do the test ourselves, but we've read that there is a scalability issue with uh, in an increasing amount of realm, we're speaking about a couple of tens or at hundred, then the, the dashboard, for example, the Keycloak UI loads very slow or slower and slower, and apparently maybe or even the authentication flows themselves. So as I said, we didn't test it ourselves, but we've seen issues related to that. Do you have any updates on that? Um, uh, I can confirm that the admin UI is slow with lots of realms. Um, there are some, at the, it's not solved yet, um, that's true. Uh, there are some workarounds around that, that if you don't have an admin or master realm that manages all the other realms, that you can like decouple your realms, but that might be controversial or that might not work for your setup, put it this way. But if you like remove the connections between of the new customer realms to the master realm, then, it, then you might be able to scale a bit better, put it this way. But we can discuss it after the talk if you want to. Yeah. Um, but if you think that there's an issue, please vote for the issues you found on GitHub on this one. Sure. And maybe, um, yeah. Um, we're also using a key cloak for uh, federation with multiple OpenID Connect uh, in, uh, identity providers, uh, merely for massaging the, the claims. But we have, uh, th there are some. It seems like uh, Keycloak is, insists of storing uh, a, a user um, in its own database because the session is tied together with the user, uh, even though that there are no actually need for a, a, a user, concrete user in, 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 in our case. So we ended up making a plugin that actually deletes the user after a while. Is there any um, plans for making a, like a transient uh, a user that would expire after a certain uh, period of in inactivity. Does, did that make sense? There have been discussions around that around the new store that is then event about to land eventually, some time out um, for all the entities that there are that they can eventually expire, but we're not there yet. So the solution you're proposing might be a good sort of one. Yeah. No. Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks for your presentations and uh, um, your open source work in general. Um, I'm using the Keycloak operator, um, the Quarkus one, for, um, I don't know, a few months now. And at the moment, you only support the Realm import CRDs to create realms. Um, and according to documentation, like you expected to drop um, lifecycle management of users and realms in general in Keycloak uh, 21, I guess, which is already out and uh, it's been po po um, postponed. But um, there's no information uh, until, until when. And do you generally plan to support manage the full management cycle of realms, like even deleting ones once the CRD for the realm is deleted? Um, yeah, so um, maybe to extend the question a bit. Um, so at the moment, it's you have the, the new operator that doesn't support the things you mentioned, like users and clients, for example. And then and the current suggestion is to use the old operator to do that at the same time. Maybe. Um, there have been ideas around that saying with a new store based on that, that you can have a file based store for realms for clients, for users, for Keycloak and we're currently working on that. So one of the ideas is and the preferred way uh, to do that for, for the maintainers as I understand it, I'm not a maintainer, I'm only a developer. So the preferred way would be to um, have CODs that would feed then into a, a file based, uh, I would say realm layout. And once they feed in there, um, also deleting those would delete this as well from that file store. 
So that's the, the, the general route we're taking, but I can't tell you when it's going to be arriving. Okay, thanks. Hello, um, so I pretty much had the same question. So we operated to the latest uh, key clock operator. And uh, if you change the configuration in key clock, it's not backported to the new uh, key clock realme import custom resource. And um, we can't override existing realms, but we changed the code so that it's possible. Mm -hmm. And are there plans to change that in the future? With, but you explained with the file based. With the file based store, yeah. that would be possible. So you can have the file based store that's, yeah. that's all on the horizon eventually, or maybe a little bit behind the horizon. So, uh, <laughs> so that you, you can have that file store in read write mode. So you can um, go by the UI and uh, change the user, and then it's going to be written to the file, or you can have it in read only mode. Okay. Um, but I, but well, read only users are a bit of a tricky thing, right? So even if you're logging in, you might have a, like a failed password count um, that you want to upgrade. So it's a bit of a, having read-only entities has some edges that are quite difficult. Okay. So um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. So um, yeah, let's close this session officially. We are here for, uh, for all week. <laughs> and uh, please gather here at the stage if you have more questions, if you want to pick up some stickers. I also have some cue cards with the facts around Keycloak if you want to convince a colleague or manager